Let's okay, I suppose. I mean, I think I know more about him than they do, you know, because they're just a biologist. But um, to be fair, because, you know, Darwin was actually a geologist to start, sort of, in, in those days. Anyway, Dale uh, called me up and he said, would I, would I be able to uh, speak to you guys? And I said, sure. Uh, it'd be a lot of fun. I, uh, I hear uh, Torian's um, story about as he gets closer to the administrative top of the university, it becomes uh, more slippery uh, than ever. And I can tell you that I've been in the business for years and I see exactly the same problem. So um, you just have to keep, keep fighting and keep uh, and basically, uh, and win the battlefield. You know, if you want to make your points about about these crazy people, then what you have to do is is do a better job than what they do. And I think we can do that. So, uh, uh, Dale asked me if I talk about evolution, but maybe more from the, the geological point of view. <laughs> There's some lightning outside. <laughs> it's a message. It's a message. <laughs> right. Okay. So. Uh, well, we've, we've all seen lots of pictures of, of Darwin, and I, maybe one of these is, is on the cake at the back, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know how you get a cake through a photocopier, but uh, <laughs> it looks like you can do it. Um, so here's Darwin as a young man, and here he's looking a little more serious, and, then, and there he is at the end, he's a lot older. And uh, I think one of the messages about this slide is that you can be bald and still have an impact. Your life is not over as a man if you lose your hair early. Um, Darwin seems to be the living while well, he's not living anymore. Proof of that. Okay, so, uh, by the way, on the, on the radio today, I was listening to a local show, and they said that Darwin was born in 1882. Of course, we know that that's not true. But um, anyway, so people do have a few uh, misconceptions. Well, uh, I lecture on Darwin and, uh, and, uh, and evolutionary theory and, and I suppose the various tenets of, of uh, evolution in my paleontology class because I think that every geology student should know, what should, of course they have to know about fossils, but they also should know about what fossils mean for, for the evolution of life because I think every sentient human being, now that might separate a number of people out, I'm not sure, should know what is evolution. Okay, so um, what I'm going to tell you now is, is a lot of this stuff I teach, I teach my students. Now, I know a lot of them don't learn it because I mark their exams and I fail them. And, and I now don't even let them back in. You know, if you pay 500 bucks, I guess I get a little bit of that indirectly for my salary. One kick at the can, you blow it, you're not, you're not invited back. Darwin, I suppose, might have failed my paleo class, actually. So it's a good thing we, we were not too strict. He was born number five of six children into a very loving household, as you were probably told last year by Dick Neal, who's a, an old friend of mine and um, uh, a favorite bi a biologist, actually. And uh, he was related to Erasmus Darwin, who you might know um, as sort of a philosopher, natural historian, who wrote a book uh, called Zoonomia in the late, 18, the late 1700s. You know, people talk about this book as, as if it sort of was a, a kind of a harbinger of, of, of Darwin's book or even gave him some think, uh, some set him on their track. <coughs> I actually went and looked at it in the library. I, you know, I think it's a really strange book, actually. It's the sort of thing that people living out in the boonies and cabins in B.C., send in, you know, for you to publish. Or we get stuff in the journal that I edit, we get papers like this sometimes from some weird person out there in the desert or, you know, in an ashram or something, and they think they found the, the great secret to life, the universe, and everything. And, and I sort of think that Erasmus' book was a bit like that. Now, I don't want to give you the wrong idea, but it is a peculiar book, and it isn't really very scientific. But then in those days, in the 1700s, people didn't write the way they do now. Even Darwin didn't write the way we are forced to write in our science now. Okay, so Darwin went to school. He didn't like it. He was probably a bad student. Uh, uh, he was bored with it. It was a classic kind of education in those days. The emphasis is on learning your Greek and your Latin and all that kind of stuff, which, which would, you know, 
Well, I took Latin for three years, and I was so glad. I only took it because the teacher was a friend of my aunt, and I had to take it. If I didn't take it, I would have been in trouble. And then I dropped out of English, and the teacher of English was another friend of my aunt, and I got into trouble. Anyway, then he went to, to Edinburgh, and he studied medicine, and didn't like that either. And he then went to switch to Cambridge, theology of all things, but that's, of course, what people taught in those days. It wasn't like you can go in and do basket weaving and other valuable programs. You can do that at the University of Saskatchewan. You can do those now, but you couldn't in those days. So then, while he was at, at Cambridge, he was very lucky to fall, to become essentially kind of an acolyte, sort of um, a young, enthusiastic guy with lots of experience um, in, in collecting bugs and and rocks and so on, and he spent time uh, in discussion groups, if you like, maybe a bit like this perhaps, with uh, Henslow, John Stevens Henslow, who was a, a botanist, and Reverend Adam Sedgwick, who was a geology professor. And he's very, he, he was and, and became even more famous as a geology professor, and uh, the, the museum at Cambridge, the Geology Museum, is named after him as the Sedgwick Museum. And even though, as it turned out, he never agreed with Darwin's thinking about evolution, he still respected him. And, uh, and, uh, but he was, he's on record for thinking that evolution was all bunker. At least Darwin's explanation for it. So here's Adam Sedgwick, and he looks like a very nice fellow here. He's quite handsome, actually. Uh, um, uh, we have a picture of him in our department as a much older man, and he looks very grumpy. He looks kind of mean, like he's sort of been at it for so long, and maybe he kind of he kind of became an old fossil, like me, I suppose. <laughs> and, and as he got older, he's kind of mean. Kind of mean. Well, one thing that, that Sedgwick did for Darwin, Dar he did a lot of good things for Darwin, but he, at the end of Darwin's undergraduate days, he took him into the field, okay, where every geology student should go. Now, this is a hard thing for administrators and universities to understand because you, know, you don't need to do that, do you? Well, it's kind of like doing medicine and you have to practice on cadavers and, and practice doing clinical work. It's the same with geology. You really have to go out there and do it and get your hand lens and your hammer out and do it. And so this is what Darwin did for just two weeks. Um, Adam Sedgwick was mapping um, in sort of central, and, and, uh, central Wales, basically, more central Wales. And those rocks there are Cambrian and Ordovician shales. So they're around half a billion years old. And they have a lot of fossils in some places. And the most common fossil that you, you see when you're there are trilobites. Okay, so here is, I'm sure Darwin ran into lots of fossils when he was in school at the university. But here he was in the field, and Sedgwick was showing him field geology, relationships of faults, and perhaps lateral changes, you go to this valley and it's sort of sandy and you go over here and it's shaly and it's a little different and you have fossils here and you don't have any over there. So Darwin began to understand from practical experience field geology. 